Namaste. In today's lecture, we have with us Sri Vardarajan Kannan. He lives in the USA and is a financial executive. Successful not only in his work and career, Sri Vardarajan Kannan has been a practitioner of Raja Yoga for over 40 years. He is also a trainer and has explored the science, philosophy and practice of Raja Yoga very deeply. He is going to share with us his understanding and experience on the efficacy of Raja Yoga. Earlier, we had explored this topic with Sri Rishi Ranjan, who had introduced us to Raja Yoga. Let us go on and see just how efficient this practice can be if well done and well guided. Sri Kannan explains the evolution of Raja Yoga over the past 10,000 years, starting from the time of Lord Rama. He also explains the discoveries made by Pujya Ramchandraji of Fatehgarh, known as Lalaji Maharaj, and Pujya Babuji Maharaj, Sri Ramchandraji of Shah Jahanpur. Both of these saints lived in the 19th and 20th century, respectively. Today, they are known the world over as the founders of the Sahaj Marg method or the heartfulness system of meditation and Raja Yoga practice. He takes us into the wondrous realms of exploring science and spirituality by looking at Raja Yoga through the lens of neuropsychology and psychophysiology to see how they support the synthesis of science and spirituality, especially the way it is practiced in the heartfulness meditation system. Let's listen to him. Namaste everyone. Welcome to this um, session on efficacy of Raj Yoga. We have had uh, quite a few lectures on various types of yoga and also how there are two sides to yoga. One is all of the asanas and preliminaries, and also how we can meditate and do dhyana and dharana, and also achieve the goals. And we have different goals that we set up for ourselves, from stress management to self-realization. But as far as yoga for unity is concerned, it is the search for that unity. How does it feel? to become united? What are the markers along the way? And how do we recognize those markers? And we know there are probably several types of yogas and especially four broad categories of yoga, not only a Hatha yoga, but also in terms of the contemplative side of it, which is Bhakti yoga, Karma yoga, Jnana yoga, and Raja yoga. And the previous um, uh, lecturer, I think uh, Mr. Rishi Ranjan, he introduced Raj Yoga. And he also touched upon the Raj Yoga that is offered by Heartfulness Institute. Previously, um, we had this uh, uh, system of Raj Yoga way back during Lord Rama's time. It was 10,000 years ago now. There were people, ordinary people, talking about Raj Yoga, practicing Raj Yoga. And in Darbars and kingdoms, they were debating about Raj Yoga. And we all know what happened during the time of Ramayana. And then Lord Krishna came along. It was probably about 5,000 years ago now. And he introduced Bhakti Yoga into Raj Yoga. And what happened after that? I think bhakti got introduced and practiced without any regard to Raja Yoga. And there have been proliferation of faith-based religions and faith-based worship. But unfortunately, there has not been enough of Raja Yoga element in it. So Raja Yoga by itself during Lord Rama's time seems to have been inadequate. And why? Both Lord Rama and Ravana, both were tapasvis, both were yogis. And Rama, of course, we know the contrast between Rama and Ravana. And how did that, that come about? Both Rama and Ravana had 
their kundalini um, aroused the reason i i want to talk about some of these uh, aspects at a very um, early part of the discussion is to make sure that we um, follow a path that is well researched well practiced well established and also allow ourselves the practical experience of doing a sadhana doing a meditative practice so that we can experience the benefits of it first hand the science of yoga on the physical side is very palpable perceptible and it's easy for us to uh, uh you know research and then have cause and effect relationships but when it comes to the contemplative side the neuroscientific side the um subtle body improvement side it is a combination of a little bit of mystery because we don't have vocabulary we don't have prior knowledge to understand what it is uh that we feel when we progress so the um the misunderstanding that we all have with respect to various types of meditative practices and its effect on us needs to be um eradicated and one such misunderstanding is around kundalini yoga kundalini um gets awakened in a natural fashion when all the chakras are purified and to purify the uh, chakras the only effective means is raja yoga and of course there are uh, breathing exercises or kriya yoga which is also part of raja yoga but we will come to that as to how uh, patanjali's ashtanga yoga you know provides the foundation for uh, raja yoga and also how patanjali's um, ashtanga yoga has been remodeled or improved by um the saints uh, that came in the 18 uh, 1800s uh, shri ramchandra of fatehgar and also his disciple shri ramchandra of shah jahanpur affectionately called as lala ji and babu ji and how they have been pioneering uh, both uh, research as well as new knowledge of how to make raja yoga more effective especially for for the modern day um, a people to practice babu ji maharaj says that uh, liberation salvation and realization these are birth rights of human beings all of us just not a few of us so for both lala ji and babu ji the ramchandras of fatehgarh and shah jahanpur it was important for them that they take this brahma vidya to common man it is not the privilege of a select few but it is to be spread far and wide to all the human beings all over the globe so they thought about how to make this raja yoga more effective and more suitable for the common day people so we all know that the purpose of yoga and meditation is to unite with the ultimate or to seek the ultimate reality or the truth but what does it mean in one way we can uh, ask that question is the traditional question of who am i where am i going where did i come from so this innate search to ask that question and to search for answers takes us to a simple idea that we came from a source and we want to go back to that source now in raj yoga it is the king of yogas we use the mind because the mind in a human being is the connecting link between the body and the soul and so we use the mind to regulate itself purify itself and focus on the goal so the simple idea behind raj yoga is to use the kingly thing in a man that is the mind to see how we can help with respect to the bodily orientation and also in terms of our focus on wanting to go back to the source it is the research finding of uh, ramchandra babuji maharaj and lalaji 
that our mind comes from the time of creation there is a similarity between our mind and that of the cosmic mind or the absolute mind we all have this idea that there is a greater intelligence that is keeping this universe universe in order there is this cosmic intelligence uh, that is that is you know it is a principle of nature there is a sequence and an order to it so there is a sense of proportion to it and there is a natural way they balance themselves so we all uh, are able to admire the balance in nature even if you know there is a calamity and the, and that calamity is considered to be nature adjusting itself to rebalance itself similarly we human beings we have this you know uh, uh part we have the similarity of that cosmic mind and in some fashion or the other we also go through uh, a calamity in ourselves rebalancing in ourselves whenever we are off balance so there is an innate nature in us that is if we go off balance there is something that puts us on balance so how does it happen it happens perhaps over a long period of time it could happen um, immediately for example if we ate something that didn't fit our stomach then we have some sort of um, stomach ache and uh, the body throws itself uh, throw uh, throws the um, unwanted things out and so we are able to balance ourselves so there is a na- balance in nature there is also a, a balance or an equilibrium there is a there is an innate um, calmness that we we should be able to recognize and experience so the reason i am trying to bring about this similarity between uh, the nature of man and the nature of creation let us say is to from the very beginning uh, drive home a point that we need to understand how we human beings are formed and how there are finer aspirations that is going to override the uh, lower aspirations and how we have to align ourselves for the higher aspiration in order for us to uh, be happy be joyful uh, and enjoy life as it presents itself and also continue to evolve and journey and move towards the soul one of the important things about raj yoga is that it does not require any faith or belief it is purely based on experience uh, almost about uh, 40 years ago now um, when i was a teenager i got very confused about the religions of the world actually not only religions that were practiced in india at that time but also all over the place so i became a disbeliever and um, luckily after 5 years i came across uh, a friend of mine who was meditating in this uh, heartfulness uh, system of practice and he said you have nothing to lose except to spend about an hour a day and meditate and so i sat and meditated and i felt something and that experience during the first meditation is what has um, inspired me to continue on and i didn't have any belief in god i did not even understand how uh, what uh, why so many religions and things like that but there was something that was telling me that i need to know as much to disbelieve in something as much as to believe in something so how do i know the best way to know is to experience so raj yoga puts experience ahead of anything else so that is why it is effective if you are able to experience the progress if you are able to convince yourself that you are able to grow doing this practice then it is something that will last with you for a long time i also want to um, experiment something here perhaps we can um think about our life our current situation in life for a few minutes so the reason for this is that we said raja yoga is the yoga of the mind and the kingly thing in us is the mind so understanding how mind works 
is very important and how uh, we have formed our personality is important how we want to re um, uh, shape ourselves reprogram ourselves uh, and change ourselves is important and so i just want to do a simple experiment and um, uh, i would like you to think about your current situation in life for a few minutes you are welcome to close your eyes if you are not driving or uh, standing or walking and so uh, if you just simply close your eyes uh, for just a couple of minutes and just breathe normally and let your mind wander So if you are done <clears throat> So what thoughts did come to your mind what sort of thoughts Did you feel any emotions So just stay on that for a couple of minutes So what thoughts came to my mind when i was calm and quiet may not be calm but quiet with my eyes closed and did i feel any emotions now if we can ask ourselves where did they come from where did those thoughts come from why did they come and if you felt any emotions where did they come from in fact you can do this exercise after the session is over take a little bit longer time but what i'm trying to drive home is that thinking and thoughts one is a process another is a is an event right and even thinking at times is not in our real control it is not like moving a chip on the table so there is a little bit of a uh, difficulty in terms of exactly pinpointing where these thoughts are coming from from inside ourselves it's not coming from outside it could come from outside there are scientific theories uh that validate that that you know you can catch the a thought from someone else but emotions how about emotions where are they coming from so there is a theory of samskara or theory of impressions and which basically says that when the unwinding of the impressions happen see when we close our eyes and try to draw ourselves internally all of our external faculties are uh, in a in a in a non engaged manner i mean they are open but they are not engaged when our faculties are open when our eyes are open ears are open uh, and of course ears nose and everything is open we are able to engage in the outside uh, world and so there we are taking in impressions but when we close our eyes and sit in a quiet place and what happens is that all those impressions that have gone in inside are coming out in a random fashion um and 
normally there is a last in first out type of a scenario with respect to memory patterns. But there are some deeper impressions, very deep impressions, childhood impressions. Uh, and they will come out uh, as our personality trait. So at the end of the day, we are bundle of our thoughts, actions, and uh, reactions, and feelings and emotions. So the entire composite is deep inside us. And they come out um, you know, in, a, in a fashion that is uh, very difficult to uh, understand. And yet, there are patterns that we can recognize. And that patterns are our personality. And if you want to change our personality, we want to be able to understand how these impressions are stored in our body and psyche. So the theory of impressions, unlike karma, for example, good karma, bad karma, or fate, where it, it, it almost uh, you know, um, tells us as if uh, we cannot change our future. And so Daji has written a book on um, uh, uh, destiny, uh, designing our own destiny. So he beautifully says that we can change our destiny only in the present. The choices that we make in the present will have an impact on our future, not on the past, but in the future. But how do we process the past in the present? It's only to have an attitude that is positive, that is forgiving, that is loving, that is compassionate. And so we are able to move forward. So this entire exercise of Raj Yoga is actually resetting our mental frame in order to regulate itself, purify itself, and focus the mind on the goal. Now, how do we regulate, purify, and focus? Of course, in um, Vedic tradition, uh, we have the Shravana, Manana, and Nidityasana, which is uh, learning what is good and right, contemplating and grasping the meaning of what is good and right and be convinced by it. And Nidityasana is to practice every day so that this knowledge uh, of both Shravana and knowledge of both uh, and Manana, we are able to establish by practicing. We all know that knowledge alone doesn't make us be we have to do what we learned and practice it and develop the skill and so that we can be that we want to be. So what are we going to study, contemplate, and practice? And do we have to practice this sequentially or can we practice simultaneously? These are questions uh, that are relevant when we take up how uh, the Ashtanga Yoga lays itself out. I also want to go back to um, Lord Rama's time and Krishna's time where uh, Raja Yoga was in existence uh, 10,000 years ago and Bhakti Yoga was introduced as part of Raja Yoga when Lord Krishna came along. But during Lord Rama's time, there was not much discussion about purity of the mind. There is, I mean, my understanding of that period is that um, many people uh, acquired powers. Uh, Rama had powers because he was an avatar. And Ravana had powers because he was one of the greatest um, meditators or tapasvis. So much so that um, they had to get boons from gods uh, because they were so powerful. But what happened? The power corrupted the one without purity. So it is very important that the famous saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, is true even in the field of spirituality. And so during Rama's time, the emphasis on purity was not there or at least I have not come across the emphasis on purity. There is an enormous amount of talk about dharma, doing one's duty. 
But again, purity is something that is significantly missing from the emphasis until um, Ashtanga Yoga came along. So there is an evolution of Raja Yoga where from Rama's time and Krishna's time where he introduces bhakti into this. And then, of course, we have enormous amount of research in Vedanta about knowledge, about Jnana Yoga. And of course, uh, Karma Yoga is also something that both um, Swami Vivekananda and Lord Krishna have emphasized, where uh, we do our karma without being attached to the results of it. But even that has been misunderstood by many, many of us, because when we do work, we work only for results. But it is the attachment, the ego that, that gets attached to the, to the results of the work as if I did the work and I produce the result creates the solidification of ego. So in Ashtanga Yoga, the whole emphasis is the, the regulation of the mind, the purification of the mind. And finally, it leads us into uh, you know, focusing the mind on the goal. We all know that uh, the eight steps of Patanjali has Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratihara, Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. And the first four steps are more physical, right? It, uh, the health, uh, as well as the attitudes and uh, what we should do and what we should not do, uh, the external kriyas uh, and things like that. And Pratyahara begins the process of withdrawal, going back inside, and dharana with a with an uh, with um, uh, a goal to focus on and dhyana to meditate on it so that the idea expands it is not a concentration that we want to uh, you know um, the, with concentration the mind becomes heavy and so dhyana is a very loose process but yet very um, progressively uh, useful in terms of uh, attaining better subtlety within ourselves and finally it lands us into samadhi but today's world is very busy. We are very busy. And um, the past 40 years of industrialization, modernization, urbanization have resulted in um, us um, getting away from a lot of things that um, are uh, previously available. Um, and so in today's busy life and yeah, when we have family life, how do we practice Raja Yoga if we have to practice Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, and then come to Dhyana? And so it was in the 18, um, uh, hundreds, late 1800s, um, Sri Ramchandra Fatehgar, he you know, introduced the idea of meditating on the heart directly. That would be the seventh step in the Ashtanga Yoga. Not that he did not recognize that we have to have um, the first few steps baked in uh, as pros of our uh, practice of dhyana and day-to-day -day life. And this system is called Sahaj Mark system of Raja Yoga meditation or heartfulness way of Raja Yoga meditation. Why? You start straight with dhyana. And when do you start? when you are 15 years or older. You can start meditating when you are 15 years or older. And so right from the beginning, we are able to take up an idea to meditate upon. See, the regulation and the purification and the focusing of the mind can start from the get-go while the yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, and pratyahara can accompany dhyana and the result of this kind of a practice is automatically dharana, which is used for our, which can be used in our day-to-day -day life to make us more efficient. And of course, with the help of a guru, uh, we will be pushed into states of samadhi. So <clears throat> in our um, tradition, especially Vedic tradition, there are fourfold practices of reaching the goal, right? And that is called sadhana chatushtaya. And in that, we got viveka, vairagya, shatsampati, and mamukshatva as the four 
uh, fold practices. And under such sampakti, we have sama and other things. And sama takes you through pravriti path to dhyana. So we have a chart, we will show it to you. And by doing dhyana under a capable guide, we are able to uh, attain a condition of Sahaj Samadhi. Now, this path from, you know, from all the way uh, uh, at the top to straight to Dhyana is a very bold discovery uh, by Ramchandra of uh, Fatehgarh and his disciple uh, in Shah Jahanpur. And um, it is very significant um, discovery. And as well as it is something that has not been fully uh, grasped and appreciated by um, the various uh, teachers of yoga. Uh, I think the um, call of today is um, to make this practice available to common man, number one, and also to make it simple and practicable for everyday people. Um, today's world is a lot more challenging than what it was about 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And so the call of the time is to adopt a simple and effective practice that is available to everybody without any distinction of money, without any distinction of language or color or, you know, absolutely no caste at all. And also the region that they belong in. So this system of Raja Yoga under heartfulness is, it starts straight with Dhyana, as we said, and even there, we are going to take up the highest ideal that we want to achieve. From the get-go, we are not only taught to meditate, but also meditate on the heart with the idea that we are connected with the source. To me, it is like the hypothesis that we make in, in science. And if the aim of Raja Yoga is to become one with the ultimate, we start with that idea from the get-go. And the, um, the bold move in heartfulness to take up that as the fundamental question, how are we going to do all the preliminary steps to prepare ourselves for that? And the answer is, it has to happen every day simultaneously. You know, when we eat um, food, we eat one um, morsel at a time, one variety at a time. But somehow the body is able to take the nutrition from all the sources of food over a long period of time and you know, continue to energize the body, continue to nurture and nourish the body and keep it balanced. The body itself, as I was saying previously, is part of nature and it works perfectly when it is in balance. When it is not in balance, it has to find a way to fix itself. And so when we take up this highest ideal, and contemplate on it, meditate on it, and with a capable guru, we are embarking upon the most effective um, system of Raja Yoga meditation. And it also is scientific for, we are the experimenter, we are the experiment, and we are going to be the result of that experiment. And now coming a little bit into um, the, um, the Viveka and Vairagya, which are the, the ability to discern and also ability to be non-attached to various uh, lower levels of distractions uh, so that we can be focused on the highest. That is possible only when our mind gets a perspective. How do we know? what is right and wrong if the mind does not have that perspective. 
how can we control ourselves by not being attracted to unwanted things? Vairagya, how is that possible unless the mind is regulated? So both Viveka and Vairagya is a result of a regulated mind, of a purified mind, of a focused mind. And so Babuji very emphatically said when he wrote this book on efficacy of Raja Yoga that Viveka and Vairagya will be the result of a meditation done right. And so, uh, so now let us look at the scientific basis of Raja Yoga and especially the heartfulness system. I mean, in one of the earlier um, slides, we talked about the theory of impressions. It was a simple idea that when our faculties are engaged, we are forming impressions. And these impressions are not merely day-to-day uh, -day events and day-to-day -day memories, but also deeper impressions. The impressions that, are, uh, that we form when we are younger, when we form, when we, when we are sh under shock, when we are in some uh, sort of trauma. And there is a book called The Body Keeps a Score, which is uh, written by Dr. Basil van der Kolk. It's one of my favorite books where it talks about, of course, it is on, on, on uh, um, examining uh, the patients with trauma and things like that. But um, he exposes the tremendous power of our relationships uh, of, uh, with the brain and the mind, relationships, relationship between the brain and the mind, and also the, our ability to hurt and to heal. And um, in one of the um, uh, yoga and wellness magazines, uh, Nicole Cutler writes, a stressor that is too much for a person to handle overloads the nervous system, stopping the trauma from processing. This overload halts the body in its instinctive fight or flight response, causing traumatic energy to be stored in the surrounding muscles, organs, and connective tissue. This is very important, very significant, actually. This is the research work of uh, Dr. Basil van der Kolk, but I like the paraphrase done by Nicole. She says that a, a stressor or a trauma is too much for us to process. And when it happens repeatedly, it goes deep into our body and it halts the process of response. And then what happens? If there is no reaction to a cause, the cause remains to be unraveled later on. It is like a coil um, uh, that is uh, wound up. So if there is an immediate reaction, perhaps the trauma got released. But if there is no possibility you are helpless. You, you are under some kind of a compulsion that you are not able to immediately, instinctively respond with your fight or flight mode. What happens? You freeze. That is the worst you know, situation one can get into. But many of us have gone through, especially when we were children, we have been frozen with uh, events and um, emotional stress that we had no um, understanding of, or we did not have any outlet immediately. And this energy, she says this, this traumatic energy is stored in the surrounding muscles, organs, and connective tissue. This is significant because in um, Efficacy of Raja Yoga, Babuji writes that, and also in his uh, research, he has stated, that all these impressions, the deeper impressions, are stored in not only various chakras, but also in the intervening layers of our muscles and tissue inside us. And so even the purification can be done in a manner that relieves the body of this uh, heaviness. And so we will come to how, in heartfulness, we have various tools that help in the process of removing these impressions in a very tangible fashion. 
So the first thing is impressions create um, a memory and they are stored in our muscles and organs and tissues. But in yogic parlance, we can say they are the, the, each chakra has the, its own characteristic and also the surrounding area also become uh, a storehouse of these impressions. The second thing that I want to talk about is the autogenic feature of our body and mind. The autogenic, uh, this is Mayo Clinic has talked about it a lot. I like their explanation of this. Autogenic means something that comes from within you. So when we make positive suggestion, it helps. When we feel um, uh, good, that comes from within us, but we can do something about it or we can think of something that makes us feel good. There are researchers that show that if you just imagine that you exercised in a sincere way, then there are some um, benefits that the muscles actually get, get strengthened. So the autogenic feature of relaxation and rejuvenation that we have in heartfulness also has a scientific basis for it. Of course, we all know about the power of positive thinking and neuroplasticity. Um, there is an enormous amount of research done, uh, not only in telepathy, but also how thoughts or energy uh, um, strings that are released from your brain and they can have a quantity of megahertz. Um, Dr. Michael Parsinger um, has done research and his book uh, is um, the No More Secrets. So that's a fascinating book where he talks about how when we think a thought, we release that thought. However, um, you know, uh, minor it may be in terms of the megahertz uh, uh, in a quantity unit, it can be caught by a sensitive mind. So thought is not something that you can hold within yourself, it can be released. So if you have a positive thought about someone else, if you have a, a vision that the humanity is becoming one, or if you have a vision that all the people are becoming spiritualized, then it will have an impact because these thoughts are traveling and are caught by people that are sensitive to those thoughts. If more people have similar thoughts or same thought in a positive manner, it can help in changing the humanity. And um, we also know about the 100th monkey theory, right? So um, I think there is an enormous amount of uh, science they are all in bits and pieces, but if you are able to connect it all together, we will be able to better appreciate Raja Yoga and then combine science and spirituality to get to a new place of understanding, a new place of um, um, putting together a lifestyle that we can, we can enjoy, we can also uh, grow with it. This is a significant statement that Babuji made that man was created in the image of God not in physical term. It means he is composed of all the energy and power that nature has in the same order and potency. They are also positioned in the human body. So this is why um, many, many rishis have said that the body is the temple of God. And it is important that we take care of the body. For what? So that the indweller can be inside, safe and secure, loving and kind, and also joyful and blissful and expansionary. So we men, we human beings, have this greatest potential of using the body as the temple, and then growing within us into the reality of God. The problem with the word God is that it has been associated with so many idols and powers. 
it, it, no wonder I got confused when I was 17. And I am sure there are many, many um, young ones. They are not able to understand what God is or who God is. But if we are able to uh, demystify the idea behind God as something that we can become like, that is why it is called God realization, same as self realization. So, Daji, in one of the recent talks, Daji is our uh, current guide of heartfulness, uh, Kamlesh D. Patel is his name. He was a pharmacist, so scientist by background. And then he recently uh, talked to Ranveer about how um, we should be able to uh, aspire for the highest. And it is possible that we use our physical, mental, and spiritual orientation to reach uh, the highest while enjoying the present and also enjoying everything nature has offered with a proper sense of proportion. I also want to take a brief moment to compare the seven chakras that we talk about in, in all of the traditional um, yoga literature uh, with the innovation um, Ram Chandra has offered us. The seven chakras, um, all of us know that it starts with Muladhara and uh, goes up to SDK. And of course, Kundalini is near Muladhara. And um, in our, uh, in this heartfulness system of uh, yoga, the first three chakras are not taken immediately. They are um, adjusted or they get purified or regulated. They need to be regulated more than purification. There is not much to purify there, uh, but they get regulated uh, as we progress. And uh, we take up the Anhata Chakra, the Heart Chakra, and then the heart, as I said, uh, was is the connecting link uh, between body and mind, between here and there, uh, between um, our physical realm and our emotional, mental realm and spiritual realm. So the heart is at the center. Not only it is the fourth of the seven chakra uh, framework, but also it is in the in the middle of everything. It is the connecting link of everything. So the significance that heart plays cannot be underestimated. And that's why uh, I think this system is called heartfulness, where the heart is taken as a place of focus for meditation. Now, this heart is just not a, a chakra, but a, a constellation of several sub points. This again is a discovery of uh, Sri Ramchandra. And um, we hold in this space uh, an enormous amount of emotional uh, struggles. Heart is, is, a, is a place where uh, we have the dualities of our emotions, um, the signals of our struggles and what we have to, what is right. Um, and it has it has been for simplicity has been divided into four points point one two three four uh, which are earth chakra you know uh, atma chakra and uh, fire and water and then the fifth one is of course uh, the uh, the vishuddhi uh, you know uh, that's also point of illusion versus clarity confusion versus clarity so the point one also has several sub points and the discovery is that when we engage with the world we either like or do we dislike that is our first impression but how we process the first interaction determines the rest of the story so suppose we are pleasure oriented it goes to a sub point if we are acquisitive, it goes to different sub point. And why is it important for us to know these things? Because this is where the sufferings begin. 
Buddha said, desire is the cause of suffering. But what is desire? It has got two faces to it. I like something, I don't like something. So that is the first impression. If we are um, uh, neutral about a situation, equanimous about a situation, if it is not relevant to me, I don't have to like or dislike. Then the question becomes, what is relevant for me? What is useful for me? So that is a different type of uh, an orientation. And so the like and dislike, when it splits into sensory or acquisitive, it, the, the downward journey begins of a life, uh, which, is, which will eventually get into some sort of suffering. When I say suffering, it is more emotional suffering, not physical suffering, because body is body. It's going to have its limitations. So there will be physical pain. And, but in terms of all of the emotional suffering, which comes because of our mind getting involved in it, is the result of the involvement with the like and the dislike, which goes up in a negative cycle and creating our sensory as well as acquisitive involvement. And if you are not able to satisfy ourselves, we become restless. And when we are restless, we become angry. And when we become angry, we also become fearful. So think about this progression. And when we are fearful, we are confused. We are stuck. We are frozen. So this process is the opposite of evolution is the opposite of progress, is opposite of being spiritually evolving, is the opposite of a yogic practice. So a Raja Yoga practice under heartfulness is the antidote for all the problems in life, but it has to be practiced properly. And so this heart region, once we are able to regulate, create a balance, a balance between um, like and dislike, which means that I use what is necessary. I use what is revolution, ev evolutionary. And then I become calm, the opposite of restlessness, peaceful. Then I go, I become the opposite of anger, that is love and compassionate. And then I become the opposite of fear, that is courage. And then I realize the opposite of confusion, that is clarity. So using this practice and then removing these impressions from the various parts of the heart chakra, then we are able to feel lightness. Now the soul has kind of expanded. It was previously constricted with all this heaviness and impressions because we are slowly becoming lighter as we are releasing all these impressions. The soul is beginning to expand. It, has now, it is now ready to move into the higher dimension. What is the higher dimension? The higher dimension for, a, for the sake of simplicity is called the mind region. You know, we talked about in the seven chakra series, there is this, uh, uh, the, the third eye here, um, or the Agnya chakra, and then SDK on top of the uh, head, so here in, in heartfulness, uh, which is uh, Raj Yoga, the emphasis is purity, purification. And without purification, we will not be able to uh, advance in yoga towards self-realization or God-realization. So that is the purpose of this uh, yoga, is, is, is self-realization or God-realization. And so point number six, in uh, heartfulness is the same as Agni Chakra, and that is the point of power. And so we do, we kind of go around it while it gets purified. We do not invoke it, uh, we do not enhance it, but we go around it. And similarly, uh, as we go up to SDK, uh, SDK is um, so far has been the pinnacle of um, uh, yogic evolution, right? Uh, Vedanta talks about it. Um, all of the uh, uh, yogic traditions talk about it. And um, 
that seems to be the culmination in terms of sat chit anand but i think in order for us to realize god we have to go beyond it that is also again a discovery by uh, the uh, the the founders of uh, heartfulness system of raj yoga and um, they call the eventual uh, destination as central region so we cross through the mind region in which our e- ego is sublimated because the whole thing is about identification of the self with that of divine or renunciating the idea of the individual self so that the higher self can come into being so as we go through the mind region which again in heartfulness has got six points six sub points i should say while we circumnavigate and move past point 6 which is trikuti and sdk we refine our ego we refine refine our identification first we purify the self then we connect we become um we are able to see the same divinity in others when our ego gets re- refined we are able to see the other person is potentially equally divine while i am also growing and changing i am not there yet so i give that possibility of equality or the sameness and so what happens is that as a person now i am able to connect with the other person not with their differences not with their complementarities but with this ever growing understanding that that person is equally divine and the all the compassion that we talk about all the love for others that we talk about the empathy that we talk about the emotional intelligence that we talk about is not going to be permanent and lasting and also growing unless we are able to refine our ego in this fashion when we refine our ego in this fashion we begin to interconnect with others with a with a growing conviction that we are part of the divine we are amsa of the divine we are spark of the divine we are all the same in terms of our ultimate reality ultimate potential so this refinement of ego finally culti- cul- culminates in humility humility and courage they are not contradictions they are in fact one and when when we reach the ultimate state of humility we are able to get to the next level of you know personal evolution which uh uh babaji calls as central region so the central region is our ultimate destiny that's where we will become one with the source and um that possibility exists now thanks to the heartfulness system of raj yoga meditation and that is the efficacy of raj yoga if done properly for the purpose of achieving oneness with the source which can be called god then purity must be prevalent in our thought action feelings orientation and vision and also you know that's 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 the only way we will be able to reach the pinnacle of what raj yoga can offer so with that i invite all of you to uh, tune in to the sunday morning sessions uh, with daji i think it's uh, at uh, uh, 9 am or something like that but anyway um uh it is available to everybody uh and uh, the important thing about uh, this system of raj yoga meditation is the help that comes from the guru 
uh, we know during rama's time we had gurus uh, krishna's time we have gurus and we have gurus now and um, in this system of raja yoga meditation uh, the guru becomes more and more important as we progress initially we focus on the system the practice uh, all of the tools that heartfulness has to offer in terms of uh, meditation cleaning and also prayer but as we grow spiritually we become grateful for the real transformation that we are experiencing and that creates a relationship with the giver with the guru and then the guru is not just a physical person but we are able to connect with the guru in a more um, mystical fashion spiritual fashion because as a person uh, you know we we are who we are but as a spiritual guru it is something that we have to discover over a long period of time so the first step in associating with a guru is the practical experience practical benefit that we feel and the gratitude that it that it uh, evokes in us and then we open ourselves to the rest of the uh, process one important thing that happens that we will experience if we are willing and open is the subtle energy of pranahuti the transmission for a lack of a better term we use these words like pranahuti and transmission but it is difficult to explain it how do you explain mother's love you know how do you explain love at all it's not possible love is what love does is one way to explain it and here the uh, the subtle energy or transmission is also likened to that sort of love in, in, in a couple of minutes ago i talked about how when we refine our ego we are able to connect with others uh you know in a foundational manner that that person or that being or that you know tree or that frog is as divine as myself in terms of potentiality so we treat the other with at most respect at most reverence so when our internal changes we are able to have those kinds of perception similarly this idea of transmission is difficult to explain but we can feel it we can experience it we can appreciate it and this is this transmission is something uh, that is as original as our mind which is connected to the uh, cosmic mind it is as original as something uh, that attracts us back to the source like like the children are attracted to the mother so when we are able to open ourselves to this transmission to this type of pranahuti with the, with a guru who is transmitting all the time but only we have to open ourselves to receive it then the connection uh, is accelerated the flow is accelerated the progress is accelerated and all of the purification process is also accelerated and so our journey is one of the fastest journeys possible without any disruption because yogic journey has to be balanced so that uh you know it is an exemplification of the uh the idea of unity and integration and balance that we have to have on a daily basis even though our goal is very lofty that is to become one with the source so i hope i was able to communicate that uh, raja yoga itself has evolved from 10000 years ago to all the way uh, you know in the last century and so it is kind of um, what should i say dumb on our part to be stuck with old knowledge when new knowledge is available and um, this knowledge is freely available because brahma vidya must be you know taught free according to 
you know ancient vedic tradition and so with that kind of uh, tradition uh, and also this immense passion to offer this uh, possibility to uh, all of humanity without any distinction a uh, heartfulness system of raj yoga meditation is offered uh, far and wide totally free no strings attached and as we begin to benefit we will automatically uh, participate and contribute that is the right thing to do so with that i invite you to explore the efficacy of raj yoga offered by heartfulness which to me has taken raj yoga to what it is today thank you namaste